Hi, gang, and welcome to Unit 19, where we're going to talk about the HX, which are basically fastidious capnophilic gram-negative rods, and we're also going to talk about some aerobic gram-positive rods. So stay tuned for more on Unit 19. The HEC organisms are fastidious gram-negative rods, and they grow best with carbon dioxide. They grow best with CO2. HEC is an acronym that stands for Haemophilus, Aggregatobacter, Cardiobacterium, Iconella, and Kingella. The bottom ones, the Aggregatobacter, Cardiobacterium, Iconella, and Kingella are all slow growers. There's a really nice table in your Mahan textbook that talks about the enzymatic and fermentative and biochemical differences of all these organisms. Some characteristics that are common to the organisms among this group, um, they are small gram-negative rods. They grow better capnophilically versus aerobically. Most are slow-growing organisms. They will not grow on MAC even though they are gram-negative. Most are sensitive to penicillin, and many of these are oxidase positive. Anytime we are determining if we have a HEC organism, it's important to do an aerotolerance test where we put the organism on plates that are aerobic versus plates that are in capnophilic environment. If they grow best with CO2, then most likely they are a HEC organism. So here's kind of a nice comprehensive list of the fastidious gram-negative rods. We've got Aggregatobacter, Pasturella, Cardiobacterium, Iconella, Kingella, Capnocytophagia, Brucella, Francisella, Bartonella, Aphipia, and Bordetella. So let's go ahead and start talking with Aggregatobacter. Aggregatobacter actinomycetes mycomitans is usually found as normal oral pharyngeal flora of humans, cattle, and pigs. They can be an opportunistic pathogen and cause things like endocarditis and periodontal disease. They can also um, cause infections in people that have been bitten by cattle or pigs. Okay, now these are small gram negative rods. There's a nice figure in your book that you can take a look at and they may be, may be part of the normal mouth flora. They are associated with all kinds of diseases. I already mentioned endocarditis and periodontal disease, but also they are associated with bacteremia and wound infections. Like most HX, they grow best in a capnophilic environment and they grow especially nice on chocolate auger. Okay? The colonies adhere to the auger and you'll see star-shaped patterns after about 48 hours and they are gamma hemolytic. They will not grow on McConkey and they're catalase and nitrate reduction positive. Generally, they are oxidase negative. The indole, urea, and the X and V factors are negative and they are sensitive to penicillin. They are weak fermenters of maltose and glucose and CTA sugars. And then they, and they also produce leukotoxins that kill polymorphonuclear white cells and mononuclear cells. Let's take a look at that star-shaped pattern. Now, macroscopically, at around 48 hours, you can start to see star-shaped formations in the center of these colonies. It's best to view these colonies on a dissecting microscope. It's pretty neat and has a very unique morphology. Pasturella multiceta is one that you will see in the clinical environment from time to time. It is found in the oral cavities of cats and dogs and other animals as well. It is considered a zoonotic organism because the majority of human infections are associated with dog or cat bites. Okay? These may colonize the respiratory tract of humans and can be misidentified as Haemophilus influenza. Macroscopically, it looks a lot like Haemophilus influenza, but it will grow on blood auger. And if you remember, Haemophilus influenza does not grow on blood auger. This organism is easy to grow, and it smells similar to E. coli because of the production of indole byproducts. Pasturella multiceta is a gram-negative coxobacillus. It's actually more ovoid bacillus and the periphery is usually darker pink than the middle when you do a gram stain. This organism fails to grow on macaque, um, although there is a rare strain that could grow on macaque, most isolates of pastorella will not grow on macaque. They are strongly indole positive, they're, they're strongly spot indole positive similar to E. coli. They're catalase positive and oxidase positive ornithine decarboxylase positive, and their TSI is going to be acid over acid. They are sucrose fermenters and glucose fermenters. 
Now, there are very weak sucrose fermenters, and the TSI may actually appear alkaline over acid at 24 hours. But beyond 24 hours, they are going to start to look acid over acid. Okay? And then pastorella infections, they are associated with dog and cat bites. And I can't imagine why a dog or a cat would want to bite us. I just don't understand that. Iconella corridens is normal flora of the mouth, and it's also normal gut flora in some people. It is associated with dental infections, head and neck infections, ear infections, and human bite wounds. I always think of this as a human bite wound pathogen. It's a gram-negative coxobacillus, or slender, delicate gram-negative rods. There's a nice gram stain picture in your textbook. This organism grows on blood and chocolate, but not on mac, and it grows better with CO2. It may have a bleach-like odor. Most people can smell that bleach-like odor. I am not one of those people, but about 50% of the population can smell that bleach-like odor. Now, macroscopically, they have a very unique appearance. They can be flat and may actually pit the auger. They are very easily recognizable, and I'm going to show you what they look like in the next slide. So, when you can see... So you can see in this picture that they are flat and glidy colonies. Some pit the auger. They have a very unique macroscopic appearance. Once you've seen Iconella corridens growing, you'll probably never forget what it looks like. Iconella corridens is a HEC organism. It's catalase negative and oxidase positive. It's also nitrate reduction positive. It does not require the X and B factors, and the only reason we would set up the X and B factors is to differentiate it from homophilus species. Okay? It is the only asacrolytic HEC organism that we talk about. It's indole negative and urea negative, and it's also worth noting that it's ornithine decarboxylase positive. Now, these particular organisms, like I said, they're asacrolytic. They're not going to ferment glucose, maltose, sucrose, or lactose. Capnocytophagia is a normal respiratory organism. And once in a while, it is associated with periodontal disease. It may play a role in dental disease and serious female genital tract infections. It is a gram-negative rod. When you look at it, it's long and thin or spindle-shaped. Um, macroscopically, it's got a very unique appearance. It actually glides across the auger, um, very similar to how a proteus does, except for it doesn't glide all that far. It does require carbon dioxide, and it will not grow on macaque. It is catalase and oxidase negative. Brucella is considered a select agent B biological agent. Class B biological agents cause less mortality than class A's, but are easy to weaponize. Brucella causes what's known as brucellosis or undulant fever. Sometimes that's called Bangs disease. In humans, the disease causes fever, night sweats, chills, malaise, and a severe headache. This is a zoonotic organism as well, and it is transmitted from animals. So the population of people that are at risk for getting brucella are usually people that work with animals, like meat packers or dairy-related occupations. There are four different species, including brucella abortus, brucella melitensis, brucella suius, and brucella canis. It may be normal flora for animals, or it may lead to a spontaneous animal abortion. It is a very significant organism when found in the livestock industry. Okay, The UNL Animal Diagnostics Lab sees this organism pretty frequently, actually. It is a very tiny gram-negative coxobacillus. It only grows about 5% of the time on blood auger. It is difficult to culture. It'll grow on chocolate auger as well with CO2, and there's going to be no growth on MAC. They're slow growers, gray, smooth, raised, and translucent. Brucella is an organism that is catalase and oxidase positive. It's also urea positive, and it is a slow-growing organism that requires three to four weeks of growing time. Remember when we talked about this organism in blood cultures, we always want to hold the blood cultures for 21 days minimum. Now, rapid recovery of brucella species has occurred using an isolator lysis centrifugation blood culture method. This disease can be diagnosed serologically with what's known as the febrile agglutination test. Okay? We're going to talk more about that in upcoming lectures in microbiology. 
Francisella tularensis is considered a select A biological agent. Remember, select A biological agents are, are um, cause more mortality than the class B selective agents. Francisella tularensis causes a disease known as tularemia, and sometimes that's referred to as rabbit fever or lemming fever. Some symptoms of the disease would be fever. It is a febrile um, type of organism, causes a fever. It also will cause chills, malaise, diarrhea, and headache. It is transmitted by the bite of infected ticks and deer flies, and is also transmitted from the secretions of wild animals, such as rabbits and squirrels, deer, raccoons, and miscellaneous other rodents. Okay, Ticks and fleas that bite are an infected animal and then hop on us are what transmit Francisella tularensis to us or by inhaling the secretions of an infected animal. It is highly contagious and we do always want to work with this organism in the biological safety cabinet. It only takes about 10 to 50 organisms to lead to disease. It's a small gram-negative coxobacillus that can penetrate intact skin. Researched by many as an agent of bioterrorism, and it is estimated that if 100,000 people were exposed to this organism, 6,188 people would die. Now in 2013, there were several people in Nebraska who got tularemia when a kid ran over an infected rabbit with a mower and they aerosolized it. And then when dad and the kid were trying to clean out the mower, several people ended up getting Francisella tularensis from breathing in the secretions of the dead rabbit. Francisella tularensis does produce exotoxins, but it's highly unknown as to what its specific virulence factors are. It does have a capsule, and when that capsule is removed, it is susceptible to antibiotics. Untreated pneumonia from Francisella has a 30 to 60% mortality rate. It needs about five days to grow on chocolate, charcoal yeast extract agar, or cysteine infused blood agar with CO2. On these medias, it appears gray, raised and smooth at 72 hours. It is weak catalase positive, the oxidase, urea, and nitrate reduction tests are all negative. It may grow on MAC. It's kind of variable on MAC. And the treatment option for Francisella tularensis are the aminoglycosides. Bartonella is a small aerobic gram-negative rod that is difficult to culture. It is an opportunistic organism and may cause diseases such as cat scratch disease um, or trench fever. It may cause these diseases leading to symptoms like fever, night sweats, and that's usually due to louse infestation or it may cause um, a pustule following a cat scratch. Cat scratch disease may be correctly, incorrectly identified as being caused by Ophipia species, but once it's cultured and identified from pustules, it's now been determined that only Ophipia is associated with waterborne bacterial diseases. In Bartonella, the insect vector would be a, a louse or a lice, and that's what is, helps cause trench fever, or a cat flea, and a cat flea causes cat scratch fever. Both trench fever and cat scratch fever pre present with a rash, fever, and itchy pustules on the skin. If we wanted to culture out Bartonella, we could take our unknown sample and place it on a brain heart infusion auger or some other enriched media such as chocolate and then incubate it with CO2. The organism is biochemically inert and non-reactive, so sometimes the best way to identify this is through gas liquid chromatography or by using MALDI-TOF. MALDI-TOF, of course, is mass spectrometry. Um, molecular techniques like PCR will work also for identifying Bartonella, where we're looking for the riboflavin uh, synthanase gene, also known as RIB-C gene. Bordetella pertussis causes the disease whooping cough, and it's named after the spasmodic stage of the illness when the host starts to gasp for air. This organism adheres and replicates on ciliated respiratory epithelial cells. Those epithelial cells are also known as goblet cells. Bordetella pertussis produces a couple of virulence factors, including the pertussis toxin and adenylcyclase, which is an enzyme. 
This has, has a one to two week incubation period and the colony looks silvery white on Reagan low auger. There's no growth on blood, chocolate, or MAC even after five days. The catalase and oxidase are both positive. Urea, citrate, and nitrate reduction are negative. The direct fluorescent antibody test is one that is useful in the diagnosis, but studies show that culture is actually more sensitive than the direct fluorescent antibody test, and that's unusual. So Bordetella pertussis adheres to the ciliated columnar epithelial cells or goblet cells of the respiratory tract. So below on the bottom left, you can see colonies, I'm sorry, on the bottom right, you can see colonel, colonies of Bordetella pertussis. And then on the left, you can see pictures of um, ciliated epithelial cells. Let's go ahead and switch gears now and talk about the aerobic gram positive rods. And there's many aerobic gram positive rods on this list, including Listeria monocytogenes, Erysipelothrix ruciopathiae, Bacillus species, Carini bacterium species, also known as diphtheroids, Lactobacillus, and Arcanobacterium. Okay. One thing that's really interesting about the gram positive rods is that they produce very interesting macroscopic arrangements, microscopic arrangements on the gram stain. Sometimes these gram positive rods can appear as bent, chaining, palisading, beaded branching, log jams, or large with spores. So it just depends on which organism we're looking at on the gram stain, but some of the best gram stains to look at, the ones that are the most fun, are the gram positive rods because they have so many different unique microscopic morphologies. Listeria monocytogenes is, is a significant pathogen that can cause acute gastrointestinal disease, infant septicemia and meningitis, septicemia and meningitis in compromised patients, cervical glandular pneumonia in pregnant women, and conjunctivitis. Listeria monocytogenes is found in several places in nature, including the soil, silage, animals, milk products, and vegetation. Okay. You may recall the Blue Bunny ice cream incident that happened in the early 1990s. Many people got food poisoning because of this organism. It is a small gram positive rod and it doesn't form spores and they actually appear as log jams when you look at them on the gram stain. It does grow in cooler temperatures like four degrees and you can inoculate a broth that should be incubated cold and then subbed to a 35 degree media regularly. Usually a cold broth is subbed to 35 degree plates one time a week for three weeks. This bug grows well on blood auger and it appears beta hemolytic and resembles streptococcus group B. It's catalase positive, it's oxidase negative, and tolerates bile salts and is positive for esculin hydrolysis. The TSI is going to be um, alkaline over acid. It is a glucose fermenter, and the CAMP test is going to be positive, but it's a different type of CAMP test than we've talked about before. Instead of the arrow facing the line of Staph aureus, you're going to get a rectangular shaped CAMP reaction, not triangular. Gram positive rods that are Listeria species look like log jams on the wet prep look like long, log jams on the gram stain and they have a tumbling motility on the wet prep. This type of motility can be seen in the SIM media and it's known as an umbrella pattern and you can see that on the right. There's also a nice picture in your textbook of motility media using listeria. Erysipelothrix ruciopathiae is a gram positive rod. It is distributed in nature. It can be found in cattle, pigs, fish, and birds. It's also considered an occupational associated disease of people who handle meat, fish, or crustaceans. This particular organism causes what's known as the erysipeloid septicemia. It also causes inflammatory disease of the hands and fingers, and it is a gram positive rod, it's often going to decolorize and appear gram negative. There is no spores. 
Older colonies, when they're stained, may show longer filaments, or all, they may appear almost beaded. They are tiny alpha or gamma looking colonies on blood auger, and they do prefer a capnophilic environment. These organisms are catalase negative, and the TSI is acid over acid plus H2S. And then here on the right, we have a gram stain picture of Aerociplothrix, and they have a very interesting and unique gram stain appearance. They're gram positive rods that are kind of um, curvy. And then on the left, we can see a disease caused by um, caused by aerociplothrix, and that's going to be fisherman's cellulitis. You can see that on that gentleman's fingers there. More often than not, bacillus species is contaminated on your plates. It is found in soil, water, airborne dust particles, and it is an, often an environmental plate contaminant. Some diseases caused by various bacillus species would be anthrax, caused by bacillus anthracis, gastroenteritis, that's caused by bacillus cereus. This is a type of disease where you have a rapid onset of food poisoning, um, and there's about one to six hours until symptoms arise. Bacillus also causes septicemia, endocarditis, and ocular infections. Hopefully you never have an opportunity to see this. Bacillus anthracis is an organism that can be used for a weapon of bioterrorism, um, but you can also get this disease if you work in the cattle industry. Bacillus anthracis is a large square-ended square -ended gram positive rod with a central spore. It is not modal, and the significant thing about that is all other bacillus are modal. This particular bug may be encapsulated and it grows well on blood auger but not PEA, which is interesting because most gram positive things do grow on PEA, but Bacillus anthracis will not. It is a non-hemolytic organism on blood and demonstrates what known, what's known as medusa heads, and I'll show you that in the next slide. It produces a protective antigen, edema factor, and lethal factor toxins. There are four types of human infections caused by anthrax. The first type I want to discuss is called cutaneous anthrax. This is anthrax that's associated with handling of infected animals. So people that have cutaneous anthrax usually get cutaneous lesions, fever, malaise, and a headache. This is an occupational hazard from working with livestock. Usually the patient will develop black deep lesions or eschers on their skin. Pulmonary anthrax is from the inhalation of spores, and usually a person will develop a fever and a cough, and they can actually die relatively quickly from a pulmonary anthrax. Oral pharyngeal anthrax usually um, is the type of anthrax we get from ingesting food containing the spores. And people that have oral pharyngeal anthrax are going to have fever, nausea, bloody diarrhea, and vomiting, and that could result in shock and death. And then finally, the fourth clinical form would be gastrointestinal anthrax, and a person would get gastrointestinal anthrax from ingesting food containing spores, and these patients will have fever, nausea, bloody diarrhea, vomiting, shock, and death. So let's take a look at what anthrax looks like. On the gram stain, anthrax is a large gram positive rod with spores, and like a lot of um, organisms that are gram positive rods, they can over decolorize quite easily. The colonies macroscopically, however, are long and filamentous and they have these projections called medusa heads. You can see that it's gamma hemolytic. Other bacillus are beta hemolytic, but anthrax is a gamma. Bacillus cereus is found in nature. It's found in the soil, straw, and unprocessed rice. It can cause gastrointestinal illness from exotoxins. A common, it is a common cause of food poisoning with a profound episode of cramping and emesis lasting for about nine hours on average. Symptoms of having bacillus cereus would be profuse watery diarrhea, nausea, and abdominal cramping. It is self-limiting in 12 to 36 hours, so generally you're not going to get antibiotics for this. Um, Bacillus cereus produces large gram positive rods with subterminal spores, and it does grow on blood and PEA, and it is beta hemolytic and modal. 
Now, Bacillus anthracis, on the other hand, does not grow on PEA. It's gamma hemolytic and non-modal. So let's take a look at Bacillus cereus on the next slide. So here's a nice example of what Bacillus cereus looks like on blood auger. It's kind of a large colony, opaque, and beta hemolytic. Carini bacterium species includes all the diphtheroids. Almost always, Carini bacterium are normal flora of the skin and upper respiratory tract. Most are contaminants on your plates, but it can be a pathogen, um, or one species that can be a pathogen is Carini bacterium diphtheriae. Any, any species can be opportunistic, but for the most part, the other species are contaminants of your plates. Carini bacterium is a gram-positive rod. They do not produce spores. They appear on the gram stain as picket fences or Chinese letters. And there's some nice color plates in your textbook um, that show you what Carini bacterium species looks like. Most non-pathogenic species grow on blood auger and may resemble Staphylococcus macroscopically. <clears throat> Carini bacterium are catalase positive and oxidase negative, but most of them are not speciated. Most of the time we see these on the gram stain and we call them diphtheroids. Now, one of the diphtheroids that is problematic is Carini bacterium diphtheriae. This actually causes a disease similar to strep throat. It's an aerobic gram positive rod without spores and it is non modal. It can be club-shaped or appear as picket fences or Chinese letters. And diphtheria causes diphtheria or diphtheria pharyngitis due to the diphtheria exotoxin. This exotoxin interferes with the host cell protein synthesis, resulting in tissue death. Some symptoms of a person that has diphtheria would be fever and difficulty swallowing, swallowing, cardiac and nervous system issues. There is a vaccine available for the diphtheria toxin, and you can culture this bug on cerium telluride or Loeffler's media, and the colonies will be gray or black. In this slide, we can see the Chinese letters or picket fences um, that is the arrangement of Carini bacterium or the diphtheroids. You can see their gram positive rods that look like Chinese letters. The image on the upper left is an example of someone that has diphtheria in their throat, and you can see that their airway is, is close to being closed completely. Lactobacillus is a gram positive rod that is generally normal flora of the vagina the gastrointestinal tract, and the respiratory tract. It's generally not speciated. Usually we just call it lactobacillus species, and it grows fine on blood and chocolate, and it's going to look alpha hemolytic in most cases. They are, they are long, slender, gram-positive rods that may chain, and they do not produce spores. Um, one thing that's interesting about lactobacillus is like streptococcus, it can be used to ferment things like yogurt, sauerkraut, and pickle fish. Lactobacillus is rarely a human pathogen and it is catalase and oxidase negative. And keep in mind, you may see on your patient sample either aerobic or anaerobic lactobacillus. lactobacillus. These are gram positive rods. So here's a couple pictures of lactobacillus. You can see a squamous epithelial cell on the left and those purple chaining rods on top of the epithelial cell are lactobacillus, okay? If you can't tell if you're dealing with a gram positive rod or a gram positive cocci that's chaining, the best thing you can do is to put your sample in a broth and restain it the next day. This is gonna reveal the true morphology of the organism. Arcanobacterium hemolyticum is a significant pathogen of the throat. They are pleomorphic or slightly branching gram-positive rods. They are catalase negative. They are beta hemolytic on blood and they may resemble Streptococcus group A. Colonies are usually more dense and opaque and very white to com compared to Streptococcus pyogenes. Also, the zone of hemolysis is much more narrow than that of Strep A. This particular organism can cause pharyngitis with symptoms very similar to strep throat. It's PYR positive, just like strep A, catalase negative, just like strep A. It's reverse camp positive, and that's where the arrow goes the opposite direction, and I'm going to show you that on the next slide. 
Arcanobacterium is easiest to speciate using an API method. Okay, so one thing about Arcanobacterium is it acts a lot like a, like a Streptococcus pyogenes. Um, it can actually cause a sore throat, but the best thing you can do is gram stain it if you're not sure what it is, because Arcanobacterium is going to be a gram positive rod, while Streptococcus pyogenes is a gram positive coxie. So here's an example of the reverse camp test and what it's going to look like for Arcanobacterium. As you can see, that arrow that lays along the Staph aureus actually goes the opposite direction than that of a camp test. Okay, you can see that Arcanobacterium is a little bit more opaque and buterous than Streptococcus group A, and a throat swab with beta hemolytic colonies that don't serotype as group A should always be gram stained. Remember that Arcanobacterium are weird looking gram positive rods that can be slightly beaded or branching. All right, that's it for the HX and other miscellaneous fastidious aerobic and capnophilic organisms. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you enjoyed this semester and I'll see you next semester.